So let's chat about this, um, this really exciting conversation that apathy is boring. Um, you know, we already knew each other, but sort of helped us uh, get together in a space and talk about stuff. And now, and now we get to talk about this really big thing, which is uh, empath empathetic voting um, and like voting in solidarity and what that all looks like, which I think is really important because, you know, the project as well as a lot of people are like, everybody go out and vote, vote, vote. But I mean, there are communities of people who maybe feel like that's a hard pass and with valid, valid reasons, not like a, mm -hmm. I don't care, but in a, I've been systemically harmed by an uh, institution and perhaps engaging with it is not how I spend my Mondays. Like, I mean, fair. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this was like, do you want to maybe you like, I feel like I want to, I want to let you say stuff because I know you, you've read some articles. You uh, know me, I'm always reading articles, <laughs> always fucking reading articles. No. When we started um, talking about this, you were like, in Scandinavia, and you like listened to the politics, and I was like, whoa, I'm just trying to keep up with Canadian news. I know. Well, the thing is, we have a lot to learn um, from other places. We have a lot to learn also from democratic institutions that are older than we are. There is no shame in uh, listening to your elders. We're brown, we know. I mean, we don't, we're not, we're not always. Um, so, yeah, so empathetic voting is um i think that's where we're 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 starting right it's something that um basically it's 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 looking at voting and voting behavior from a more intersectional and and sympathetic lens so what it is is looking at voters and thinking about why they vote and how they vote based on their individual circumstances not looking at the entire population as a single swath as though everyone has you know, equal access to voting, that everyone has equal access to information around voting and has has the feeling that they are as equally valuable, connected to or empowered to participate in civic duty and politics. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a Merriam, Merriam Webster type of a um, definition, but I think, uh, you know, probably the way you and I would speak is empathetic voting or looking at voters with empathy is trying to actually understand uh, understand individuals uh, and giving people space to be to be there to be individuals even within this very large collective civic action that we take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I think a lot about, as well as um, well, I mean, there's large communities here, like indigenous communities, the black community that um, have experienced systemic harm that it like, it kind of tracks that that's like not the space that they want to engage with or that engaging is harmful. I think, I don't think a day goes by where I don't think about Mumalak Tukuk's, um farewell speech or thrown something, something like when she decided not to run for reelection and how she spoke about you know, you're inviting us into these spaces, you tell us to engage, and then there's still systemic harm, there's still colonial harm. And I just remember sitting there being like, how awful to be sold this promise of like, if you engage with the system, it'll help you. And that's not necessarily true. Um, and it shouldn't have to fall on our most, most marginalized communities to carry that on their own. Like, I can vote in solidarity of that. I can vote, use my democratic, like, right and because engaging isn't hasn't been as harmful for me um to demand better of this country but yeah i feel like what like i think like one of the things that you had sort of spoken to me about was like there are some dangers of not looking at voting from that empathetic perspective and it's like you have thoughts around that so i think what happens with uh, a lot of the vernacular around voting um is sort of like oh, if you don't vote, it's because you don't care. Or like a lot of the the actions around voting are very like, it's cheerleadery. It's like, I voted, here's a sticker. Like I'm gonna put my, the circular thing around my Facebook profile <laughs> and all of, and that does work for some people. And that is, that is definitely a tactic. But what we have realized is obviously there's no one way to, to get around how you talk to people. And one of the dangers of, I think it's called the responsabilization 
of voting, of looking at people as being passive because they don't vote, at looking at people as being lazy or misinformed or being like, if you don't vote, then like, you know, you don't get to talk about what's happening around us. There is there is an, a kernel of truth to that. And there are definitely people who are very, who have all the access in the world and are still not interested in politics and think that politics don't affect them. Uh, lucky you. I mean, that sounds like a very privileged position to think politics don't affect you. Um, but the responsabilization of the in, of the it, of the individual and emphasizing motivational factors, what that does is I think it makes some people who are not being spoken to in a way that makes sense to them feel feel left out of the conversation. And they are probably most likely people who are not only left out of the conversation of voting, but they are um, left out of the conversation of politics in general. And then there is on the flip side, there are people who are making a very deliberate choice not to vote. And, you know, you and I have spoken about this before, like I, you know, I call myself something along the lines of like an immigrant settler. Um, it's not really, it's not my place to tell someone who is indigenous um, that they need to vote. And if they don't vote, they don't care because for some indigenous folks, Canada is a, well, Canada is a violent colonial state and any participation within that violent colonial state is, you know, they don't fuck with that. And um, I don't want to speak for, for another group. I, I, that's just something that I'm mm -hmm. relaying that I have heard. And so I am, I'm not going to look at someone who's made that deliberate choice and say that they're, you know, that they don't care um, because they do care. They just don't think the system works. So. And I also think it's important to note that like, this is not a blanket statement for all indigenous, like, I know loads of Indigenous people that, that do vote, and that's not us saying. We have, um, uh, I think, a record number of Indigenous folks running for uh, election in this election. Yeah. And so, and it, I, again, it's about, yeah. the, it's about individuals and about looking at um, individuals and voting and creating space for in people to be people and not to be, you know, sort of, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Nothing we say is one size fits all, everybody. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, like, what what I also think about a lot is um, how, well, we were talking about this before, too, about how, like, this, like, feeling of, like, it, like, like, you don't care enough or, like, you don't, like, know enough about politics to engage or, you don't, whatever. And, like, I, I always say to people, you don't have to be an expert to vote because like people running in these elections aren't necessarily experts either, right? Like they don't know everything. You just have to hope that they surround themselves by people with, with expertise and lived experience, but like they're not necessarily experts either. They just understand that area of something a bit better than we do. And that doesn't make them better than us. It just makes them in a different field from us. Well, one um, empowering thing for voters to know is that, and it's, you know, something that, you know, you've probably seen memes about it is that you are the expert on your own life. Hmm. And if people felt like they knew what was best for their communities, if, 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 and again, the more marginalized the community you're a part of, the more the, you know, the bourgeoisie, the hegemony is telling you that they know what you need and they know how you should live. And what they're really saying is that you should live like a white man, but not all of us are cis hat white men. And so we can't live like that. And they no, think that they know better for what we need for our bodies, what we need for our families, what we need for our communities. And so I think as people start learning that, no, actually, I do know, I don't need to know all the vernacular. I don't need to have a poli sci degree to understand politics because I understand myself and I understand my community. Empowering people to believe that, I think, really helps them understand that they do have a right to vote and that they have um, a, a, some power in their vote. But yes, what you were saying earlier, that sort of like, if you don't vote, it's because you don't care. Well, that's like, that is hard for people who do care, but don't feel empowered. Um, and then you, you may lose that, you know, you were saying, what are some of the dangers? Is that you maybe lose that person because they don't, right. they're not finding themselves in the conversation. Um, in uh, Brooklyn, in, or was it in all of Manhattan? I think it was in Brooklyn. They have something called um, changing the conversation together. And it's a group of people who do something called deep canvassing. And so what they do is instead of going door to door, 
um, and spending a few minutes talking about what, um, what they want to do, like, you know, canvassing for a particular, um, for a particular party, they mm -hmm. go and they engage in these deep canvassing conversations where they actually ask the person, what do you want? Like, what do you, what are you looking for? And they engage in, in the very, they have these long conversations. They invest very heavily in training their volunteers to, 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 to do this. And their methodology involves asking more questions than giving answers, <laughs> which I think politicians could probably learn from. <laughs> and they did this over a couple of elections. And they actually found they, they target people who have never voted before. That's who they target, people who have just never voted. And they found of the people that they spoke to, 80% of the people who engaged with them in this deep canvassing technique ended up voting for the first time. And that's a really, really fucking high turnout. That yeah. is, mind you, I'm, I've read their report and that's what they, that they, what they said. I will caveat that there, there isn't an independent review of their results, but I don't, they're, they're volunteers. I don't know why they would lie about this. Okay. So <laughs> they, um, that's the technique they used. And I think why that technique works so well is, again, they framed it as, I'm not going to tell you what a certain leader or a party will do. I'm going to ask you what you need, and I'm going to listen to that, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold space for that. And, 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 frame, and in this relationship right now, you're actually giving me information. Mm -hmm. And I think when they did that, then the canvasser was able to say, well, you know what? You're interested in access to daycare. I hear that from you. Did you know? Now, obviously, this changing the conversation group in Brooklyn was uh, um, not a Trump. Uh, they, they were Naturally. definitely a progressive leftist um, group of folks. But they didn't go in with that aspect. They would say, did you know that under... Biden's administration, X, Y, Z would happen. I don't know. I don't know if daycare was a thing for Biden. Um, but that's how they kind of framed it. So they, they kind of let the other person, the, the person who was a voter hesitant, voting, voting hesitant, voting hesitant, yeah. Um, they let them lead the conversation. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's the way that we should approach most things. If you govern for the people, then the people should be leading the discussion, not our leaders, right? They should be listening, reflecting, and figuring out ways to set us up for success. For example, in Ontario, teaching us about civics uh, for two months in high school isn't enough. Not if you really want us to engage in it. They taught me WMIS every single, like, even when we were taking physics that had nothing to do with, like, things i had to learn women every year because they were like this girl's gonna need it i didn't but they were like this girl's gonna need it she's gonna need it so let's keep teaching them her, her about women because she's gonna work with chemicals i don't but like that's mm -hmm. what they had assumed mm -hmm. um and that's setting me up for success i'm never not gonna remember those they're burned into my brain why isn't our de democratic process burned into my brain and what has the world done what has our country done to invite people into this process that challenges it. And isn't that what we want? Don't we want to continue to evolve? But that's what, that's what you want. And that's, that's, what, that's what I'm sure people tuning in right now want. But to be honest, that's not what they want. And they, I'm using they as like a, an overarching umbrella term for the powers that be because they don't necessarily want people like you or people like me or probably a lot of your followers, a lot of people tuning in or who watch this later on IG Live. They don't necessarily want us to be fucking empowered because then they're not able to run the stru structures and systems the way that they have been doing. And so if they're also the trickle down is if they're, you're, you're talking about civics, so like your civics class. I'm the trickle down. I know. And as you should be, because uh, education is the, the education system is important. Da, 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 da. Obviously, I believe school is, you know, important. I mean, I'm wearing a shirt that says go into reading. Like, obviously, I think <laughs> like knowledge is power. Um, but although I do encourage people to goodwill hunting it and just like go to the library and learn on your own, because then you can learn what you need to learn. Mm -hmm. But a shout out to the library, which is the only place I'm a regular. Um, but I, I think that they're creating, you know, if the government wants to work the way the government works, they're going to teach you civics. They're going to teach you what you need to know in civics so that the government works the way it works. They're not going to teach you about revolution. Um, they're not going to teach mm. you about 
they're not going to teach you. They're going to teach you about civic engagement. That means falling in line and, you know, staying in your lane. They're not going to teach you about how to go faster, go harder, go better, because then you're going to take their job. <laughs> but that's why there are things like on Canada Project. You guys are doing that on your own. You're asking the questions you're making. How lucky are we that we can go on Instagram and we can unlearn together well, and we can find access because of the internet? Well, I think that's the thing that um, these structures didn't take into account. Like whether they are, like the timeline is up for debate, but what's coming isn't. Like people are becoming more informed. People are taking citizen engagement to a new level. We're changing the way we engage. It's just a matter of time for these systems are dismantled. Um, or we get into like a super oppressive state. Those are the options. It's either Gilead, you guys, or like change. <laughs> Those are the only two options we have coming for us. Um, but I think like, I think that like when we, when we hear about these like policies and like everything you were saying about like, you know, these systems, they don't want us to engage. Well, t tough. Like I'm not going anywhere. Are you? Cause I'm still no. kind of doing what we're doing. I, I flew back to vote. Yeah, exactly. You flew back to vote. I flew okay. back. You came back to I, well, also because I did not get my shit together in time to do mail-in voting. Um, just like FYI, it, the timeline is over now for anyone who hasn't voted and is watching this either today or later. Uh, obviously advanced polls are closed, mail-in voting is closed. So you will have to vote on September 20th in person. So bring water, stay hydrated and, and you know, get, the shit, never, get that shit done. It's never taken me more than five or 10 minutes. Like, and yeah. your employer has to give you three consecutive hours in a row or something, something. I don't know. We have a post on it, you guys. You can read about it later, but. Yeah, it's um, on, it's next week on Monday. Is that, is yeah, that the ele Monday. election day? Yeah. Yeah, oh, so. It's on a fucking Monday. Um, <laughs> but speaking of voting, I, um, we've talked, I know we've talked a bit about empathy around uh, voter apathy and, and getting people to, um, to get out there. But what if they're like willing to go, um, how how do you think empathy looks like at the ballot box? So many thoughts on that. But before we say that, I just want to like circle back to, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. But the one thing I want to say is like, it doesn't matter if they don't want us there, if we keep showing up. And that's how change happens. And it can't just be a couple of us doing it, which is why our project is focused on information sharing because it can't just be individuals like you and I doing this fight by ourselves it's too hard I don't want to do it alone like work smart not hard you guys so like bring on more people to help you by sharing this information and inviting people to challenge and disrupt our system it's not anti-Canadian in fact it's more aligned with what we claimed like what they taught us in civics like when they were like the country is yours and you are the country and blah, blah, blah. like great thank you so let, now I'm going to show up and now I'm gonna take up space and now I'm gonna demand change. And I hope more people join that. And the first step, unfortunately, is engaging in a colonial system that like has caused harm, but we kind of have to engage with it in order to get in there and disrupt what's going on. Um, and you know the issues that matter, like people know that. I say this to people all the time. I'm like, you don't have to understand politics. You know that there are things that are wrong in the world. Like you feel it, you understand it. when. When you see systemic, when you see the news, when you read it, like, you know that that's fucked up and it connects some way, somehow comes back to politics. Like when we all saw Jeff Bezos go into space, weren't we like, the fuck? Why is this guy going to space? But we're in a pandemic. Like, you, what's up there that you need to go, bro? Like, what's so important? And, okay, like, first of all, he didn't even go to space. I know, it's about to be like, in... of course, like, <laughs> just like, not even really space, but like, yeah, so he goes up there during a global pandemic the reason he has the money to do that is because of a policy error it's because we don't tax the ultra rich so yeah like billion they especially do not right exactly so like there's no corona in space okay not you're not wrong that's that is a valid reason to pop up there but for all i think know, i think so, i think what you're hitting on too something which to go back to your civics class lessons it's also how we talk about politics because i think for a lot of folks who don't necessarily have people in their life who they can, you know, spar on these topics with. Yeah. They think politics is this thing outside of themselves. I don't understand politics. And I love how you framed it. You were like, but you understand issues. Yeah. You have, you know, I got issues. You got them too. <laughs> so 
what's the that issue? yeah that that's the thing like you can talk about your own life and that is political because we live within a democratic system so there is politics and everything that we do so yes taxation is part of it not having you know if you if you if you're finding that you don't have enough money at the end of the month because you're spending too much on childcare, well, that is a political issue. That, mm -hmm. And you have something to say about that. And you can make a choice around that. And you might say, you know, for, for young parents or old parents or any parents who are like, I don't know anything about politics. You know, I, I spend all my time where Well, you do because that's your, you know, the personal is political and existence is resistance for a lot of communities and so just being here is part of of your you know your body politics so that and maybe it's about also in civics really talking to people about the fact that are your everyday I remember someone told me once they were like I hate being taxed like taxing is so stupid what do we get out of it and a friend of mine was like how do you think we pay for roads and we, we were yeah. very young we were very young and yeah. like, so how, how do you think we pay for roads and 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 making that connection for people like oh okay so my day to day commute is political <laughs> it is related <laughs> to taxing and to the politics so yeah giving it's all again it's about that empowerment and that empathy for the individual and i and i think also like uh that like people i think um as a person of color so my dad doesn't like voting i hope yeah whatever he's not going to watch his live so he doesn't like you're always like, he put he said something bad about me on the internet uh, but he doesn't like voting because he's like, you know, in Sri Lanka, they were systemically discriminating against Tamil people. Here, it's less obvious, but like, it's not really happening in the same way. So I'm just grateful to be here. And like, gratitude is a great emotion. We should have it. People of color who are living in Canada, most likely because y your native land is recovering from colonization, amongst other things, but like, whatever. Um, you can be grateful for the opportunity Canada gives you and also want Canada to be better. Like that is a th relationship you can have with the system in our country. And I think often people feel like, oh, well, it's better than this place or it's better than that place. It's not. Canada has a lot of issues. We just are like awkwardly like passive aggressive or quiet or media doesn't cover it. Um, and we're not talking about it, but those issues exist. Abortion issues, we've got them here. Uh, white supremacy, all over the place like gun violence it's here as well like we've got the same issues healthcare problems we've got them as well like every time i look into the states and i go oh thank god i'm not american and then i go but like we've got the same problems and, and i mean some and of our no problems people. are like trickle up from for example gun violence like a lot of the the one of the reasons why canada can't have uh would you know our gun laws are not able to um keep guns off streets the way they are say in like a place like australia is because of the u.s like the guns actually get they come through the border yeah. um but that's a different topic um okay. and you're right we cannot blame them for everything um but i i mean south asians uh under are underrepresented at the ballot box south asians do not uh vote in high numbers they um especially older generations and i think there is something about you know, the silencing of people of color, um, of immigrants, where they feel like when they came to this country, they didn't have a right to say anything. And so if you're going to make people feel like they don't have a right to speak up at work, if you're going to make them feel like they don't have a right to speak up in their communities, if they're not, a, if they're, then they're maybe not going to. And, and think of, I think someone earlier had talked about where, can, in the comments down, down in the comment box, mm -hmm. about where canvassers go, where politicians go. And I mean, mm -hmm. what languages they speak. Um, we know that outside of English and French, there is not enough content being made to bring in the fucking diversity. I mean, there's there's people in Toronto, there's someone from every country in the world and someone who speaks every language in this world. And there are people here in Toronto who do not speak English. And, and it's a beautiful thing that um, my mom used to live in little Portugal and her neighbors did, only spoke Portuguese and they were old. And so the, for, for many, many decades, they got by, got food, got their utilities done, made, made friends, had a community and they never had to learn English. They spoke Portuguese all the way through and they communicated oh. to my mom through tomatoes. So that's how okay. that, they would leave tomatoes as a way of showing neighborly love. It's very cute. So that's a beautiful thing. I, I mean, there is, um, there is definitely, and, and this, you know, it's not only in Toronto, I'm just using Toronto because that's like where my family's from. But, um, and that, 
uh, there is there is content being made in, in Portuguese. I do see that. Um, and there's content being made in, in Italian. I, I do see a little bit of that. But, you know, is there content being made in Hindi? Is there content being made in Bengali? Is there content being made in Urdu? Is it being made in Tagalog? Is it being made in, in Mandarin and Cantonese? And, you know, they're not they're not taking the time to, to access those communities either. And so those communities may feel ignored and they're not going right. to go to the ballot box. Um, and I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. We always tell people these are going to be 30 minutes and then we like have like such a great conversation and we start like losing it. But one of the things that you and I were also talking about is um, we are part of the system as, as like citizens, right? Like as people who live here, who have, that, who have the ability to vote, we are part of the system. It's not just the government and like wh wh how they handle things. It's also how we show up. So I think about this past year and the global reckoning we've been through around a pandemic in which the vaccine inequity is going to perpetuate this pandemic and like mutations of the virus and like the, the, the length of this pandemic for a long freaking time because we aren't able to vaccinate like most of the world. Um, but wealthier nations like Canada do have access to vaccines and extra vaccines and are throwing out vaccines and have people who are have the privilege to be like, nah, I'm good to vaccines. So we, we watched a global pandemic unfold. We're seeing what that inequity has looked like. We can see how it's going to continue. We watched the murder of George Floyd, which wasn't a new thing, unfortunately, but it was something that happened during the standstill moment of the pandemic. And there was some sort of global, like, understanding and acceptance and awareness around police brutality, white supremacy, and anti-Black racism. That happened and it existed. And a lot of us posted Black squares as individuals. A lot of companies posted Black squares as organizations. And a lot of leaders pledged to be against, um, to, to fight anti-Black racism um, in their spaces and in their country. And then the a more time would pass in Canada and we would we would see very little happen at like systems level um, and at, a, at organizational levels. Maybe some companies were progressive enough. I think I genuinely do feel like people are still having these conversations. I think we have changed even if our systems haven't yet. Um, at least I hope so. But then we watched as um, 215 bodies of children were recovered uh, and Canadians had to understand and grapple with something that indigenous communities always knew. Um, people who have paid it to, like been, been informed about what's going on with indigenous communities knew. But the rest of our country had this like awareness and understanding of like, oh my God, children at schools, you sent them to schools. That's, and that's like a very generous term to be using for what those institutions were. Um, and you, and they died and you buried them in unmarked graves. And that's just like, we just like had this realization around um, indigenous communities and demanding better for them and like demanding justice finally um, and truth and reconciliation. And then we watched a Muslim family uh, get killed in London, Ontario as a result of a domestic terrorist attack. All of these things, by the way, are all rooted all in the same, like in, in white supremacy, right? Like all of these things stem from that. But each of them had a public outcry, a giant public outcry. People canceled their candidate plans. They, they, you know, pledged to to be in solidarity with Muslims in this country. Um, and we posted black squares. And I'm here to tell you, it's not enough. It's not enough to feel all those things and then not vote accordingly when the election with at, at this election. It's performative to post a black square and not walk the talk. It's performative to cancel your candidate plans and not vote in solidarity um, with the indigenous people of this land for parties that care about it. And it's performative to say that like a family being killed just because they're walking down the street and visibly Muslim is like so devastating, but not vote for an anti-racist policy in these platforms. So, Absolutely, like, please, aren't, we have enough performative leaders. We as citizens shouldn't be. 
because how we act as individuals will demand better of our country. It has to, they'll have to adapt. So there is enough of us that care. So when you go to the ballot, when you go to vote, look at what these parties are doing about these issues because they've just, some of them haven't even mentioned race like in their platforms after the year we've had. I, I mean, it's, it, they, they haven't mentioned, and thank you for summarizing all of that. I mean, it's not. I know it took some time, but I felt like it had to. No, I mean, it has, it has to be said. And, and it wasn't said, you know, necessarily by the leaders. And talk about empathy again. They need to also be <laughs> empathetic towards the people they're trying to court. But it, it was shocking to me that there, were no, there was no talk about defunding the police. There was no talk about um, anti-Black racism. There was no talk about Islamophobia um explicitly they also barely talked about gender they barely talked about women like forget gender as like yeah, an all-encompassing term that covers a lot but i mean they didn't even talk about like cis white women and what they want they like they really when they say that this is supposed to be an intersectional feminist governance they were there was no intersectional um view on any of, of these conversations and of course we know that everything that you spoke about there they're all interlinked so mm -hmm. um that is very frustrating. That doesn't, um, I would say that in terms of how, how this affects voters, people need to be looking again at, um, not at party platforms and promises, but at their records and look at how they voted and look at what they actually did because on the campaign trail, you will hear promises and um, they don't, they are actually not obligated to, to do any of them. Like just cause you vote someone in, they don't have to do what they yeah. said they would. Um, and in terms of, you know, going back to our conversation about solidarity and empathy, you, you definitely should be looking if, if you are someone who empathized with any of those big sort of social justice movements that have really, um, affected us over the last 18 months, everything from the economic crisis to the pandemic, to the murder of George Floyd, to the rising of Black Lives Matter, um, to stop Asian hate, any of those things. If you were posting about them, then yes, absolutely. You should be considering that in the choice you make when you vote. And you absolutely should be looking um, that you absolutely should be looking at which party uh, is addressing those issues. And also remember that you're not just doing it for this other group that you may not be a part of. Um, it's not a sort of us versus them, like, let me vote for them. Like our liberation is all tied together, right? I am not free until you are free and until she is free, he is free, they are free. Everyone needs to be, uh, everyone needs liberation. None of us are, are free until we're all free. So it is also to your benefit <laughs> to be looking at, 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 um, at and that's something I would like to see from leadership as well, like that they're not only fighting for people who look like them and people who sound like them, but they're fighting for people who are completely different from them because it's the right thing to do. And yeah. it, it is the, that's the world they want to want to live in. We, we no longer, we know that it's not just about me or you, it's about a collective. And that, that was, that was missing, I think, in this car, in the the leadership debates and in the the platform conversations and on the campaign trail as well. That sort of thing. That's like, we're, we're we really are all in this together. And I know I'm I don't look like you, but I really want to understand you. Absolutely, and I think that's a really good way of um, of reminding people of that. Yeah, and I think um, the one thing I've been sharing with people a lot is white supremacy. Like capitalism feeds into white supremacy. So if you feel like income inequality is an issue and you're like, that's fuck that Bezos went to space while Amazon workers are da da da, like the whole thing, like we all have talked in circles about this. Yeah, um, I mean, more directly, it's a, it is a bit fucked that we're having an election right now during a massive housing crisis, um, a, 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 a job, massive job insecurity. We're dealing with an, a new generation of workers who are only understanding economic precarity. Uh, we have an increase in gender-based violence. We have an increase in houselessness. We have, um, we continue to have incredibly high suicide rates in indigenous communities. We, we don't have drinking water. <laughs> we yeah. don't have drinking water in every community in Canada. And I don't wanna say we don't have drinking water in indigenous communities because that's like a way of framing again, like 
oh, it's a different, no, we don't have drinking, fresh drinking, accessible drinking water, potable drinking water in every community in a rich, Canada has all the fresh water in the world, right? We are the kings and queens of the monarchs of fresh water. So forget um, Jeff Bezos, like he was never going to do anything for anybody. I'm, I'm really but like, I'm really, I don't know why, but there's just something about him going to space where I'm just like, I can't, and I know, like, anyways, um, the other, the other part, oh my gosh, everything that you said, I 100% want to like retweet it. Um, and then I got distracted by freaking Bezos again. And my rage. Went. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to be mad at him because he has the laugh of a devil that lives inside of uh, like a, like a murderer's skin suit. But the, the truth is like on our day to day basis, there, there are a lot of decisions being made that are um, limiting us and are, <laughs> And the system is designed that way. The system wasn't designed for all of us to succeed. And what we're asking for is a system that um, creates opportunities for more success for more people. And what that success looks like, I mean, that's a different conversation. But that is what we're what we're asking for. And I think, again, my my feeling is that people need to remember that when you go to the polls, the party you choose should not only be the party for you, it should be the party for all of us, and it should be the party that is most like that you think is most likely to help, um, you know, as many communities as possible. Knowing that you are a part of and adjacent to every single fucking one of them, and that your community, whatever you're a part of, is not going to like succeed unless all of us succeed. And very few of us, even cis hat white men, very few of them are actually part of the group that is you know control is holding the puppet strings and i'll add that like we saw immediate action um when the like in canada all things considered we saw immediate action around the pandemic serb all that stuff um at a speed that like i was like what like look at this country jumping to a crisis but we have other crises going on we have an opioid crisis we have a climate crisis we have missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, we've got so many other things going on that are big crises, mental health crisis in this country. All of them deserve that same rapid fire reaction. Like we shouldn't have to sit on things that we know are gonna make the country better. Um, and the only way that we can demand that is if we vote for people and then keep bugging the shit out of them until they're like, okay, fine, I'll just do the right thing. So that like these like, these millennials and their avocado toes shut up. Um, I mean, that the, the millennials and Gen Z are the real, real wild card. Gen Z especially are the real wild card in this yeah. election because nobody really knows how they're going to vote. So, and they are such a large and, uh, you know, according to TikTok, very active group. Um, fucking cute as shit too. So I'm with them. I love Gen Z. Um, I'm in cosplay as Gen Z every day, like just hoping that they'll <laughs> hang out with me. But I think it, it all again trickles down to the sort of we're saying the same thing but that people like you're talking about putting pressure on politicians even after the election is done and people need to know that that is also they can do that it's not just about today about september 20th and about the day that you vote for you know you gotta think about your your municipal leadership you have to be thinking about your provincial or you can be thinking about your provincial leadership and then you can hold them to task you can hold them accountable um beyond that and there's a lot of actions that happen in between protest um petitions there's civic actions that people take every single day in between elections of course elections are more mm -hmm. sal salient but i i like that you said that you need to then put the put your you know put the pressure on continuously even after somebody's elected and, and not make them feel like, oh, well, I'm in here now, so I can do whatever I want. Right, because that's just silly. They should be still listening. But um, but yeah, I think maybe this is a good place to, to wrap up unless there's any specific questions. But essentially, get out there and vote. Vote with a heart-centered approach, with a compassion, with empathy, um, and be kind to people who decide not to vote because of systemic neglect, which I mean, like, fair. Um, yeah, well, all levels <laughs> of government, we will be just as angry for other things. Um, 
we have posts on voting from abroad and um, so does Apathy is Boring. Um, we have a lot of content around like how to vote. Uh, I don't know that them off the top of my head because I voted yesterday and I didn't think about other people and how they should vote as a memorization thing. But yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, let us know if you have any other questions. Let's disrupt some shit together. Yeah. See you in the tweets. See you in the streets. <laughs> Good luck.